reading from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. This is God's word, you may be seated. Well, let me first say some, uh, some thank yous as we complete a full school year of two services. I want to say thank you to you 9 o'clock faithful for coming. Uh, um, I mean, obviously, we could not have done this service had you not been willing to, to come. So thank you for that. Well, let's say thank you to our worship team. Um, these guys have worked tirelessly. Uh, that, that song that we just sang, Then, Now, and Forevermore, is an expression of the heart of that team. Um, if you were here on Good Friday, you heard three other original songs. And uh, the, just to give you a, a perspective on the, the desire of that team is not to become famous or to you know, be recorded or anything. The, when you see the copyright on there, it says copyright skiff. When, when people, if people ever hear these songs, we want them to know that came from some church in Florida. So that's what Skiff is, okay? Um, and that's the heart of this team, is, uh, is it's about the Lord. It's about singing His praises. And uh, what a fitting song to set up this message uh, from Isaiah chapter 6, to see the Lord high and lifted up. Then, now, and forevermore, you reign from your throne. Alpha, Omega, Savior, Lord. What a beautiful articulation of the glory of our God. Um, Need to say thank you to our uh, our AV folks and their their faithful ministry to our ushers who have come. I know this has been a it's been a stretching year for us and uh, and and just in all the ministry. And so this summer we're praying will be a time of of rest uh, where we can slow things down a little, come together in fellowship and unity. But uh, we just wanted to say thank you um, to everyone for just making this possible um, to run two services and. Uh, in the Lord's timing, we, we hope we will come back to two services, but for now, we're uh, just going to enjoy the summer and, uh, and take a break. So thank you for that. Um, join me in Isaiah chapter 6 as we continue our Open the Bible series, a one-year journey through the whole Bible. Um, we have started, we start, this is part three now, part three of this series. We started in the law, the first five books of the Bible, which are just foundational to everything that we know about God and how he has made himself known in his word it comes from those first five books called the Law, the Torah, is what the Jews used to call it. So we spent the first ten weeks getting the foundational doctrines of who God is and how we know him from the Law. Then we moved through the history pretty quickly uh, and, uh, and seeing how God built up his kingdom. Jesus preached the kingdom has arrived. And to the Jewish mind, they would have thought of their kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and how God built that kingdom and how he reigned as their king. So we just finished the historical section with that time of Nehemiah having come through the exile and back into the promised land. Now, uh, obviously, there's a big section of the Bible called poetry with our Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And so if you're in your Bible reading plan, you're getting a Psalm every day, a couple verses of Proverbs every day. And, uh, and so obviously that, that is important, but we are now jumping to the prophets. So for the next two months, we'll be in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then at the end of the summer, we'll finish out this series going through the New Testament, seeing those key doctrines. And what this whole series is showing us is that the Bible is one story. It's all unified. It's all interconnected. Even though it was written over 1,600 years, 
It's all one story, and all of it is about Jesus from beginning to end. You'll see that very clearly here in Isaiah chapter 6. Now, the first line of Isaiah 6 is, In the year that King Uzziah died. You know, the first line of any book is important, right? It sets the tone for that book. Here's a, a, a new chapter, a new section of Isaiah's prophecy, and it begins with that phrase, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, uh, Isaiah was a prophet through the reigns of four kings. Uzziah was the first one. So he is a, a, a beginning prophet, you know, a pastoral resident, if you will. He was, he was new in his ministry and came in toward the end of this reign of, of King Uzziah. Isaiah's ministry was over 50 years long, and in the middle of it, you can see in this timeline, in the middle of it, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered and carried away by the Assyrian Empire. So Isaiah foresaw that judgment, he predicted that judgment, and then he was still ministering as that judgment took place. In fact, the Assyrian army came all the way to Jerusalem and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem while Isaiah was in that city with King Hezekiah. And that story is told in a couple places in the Bible, including Isaiah's book. And he opened this letter that came from the king of Assyria and brought it before the Lord in his temple and cried out to God, Isaiah did, for deliverance. And the Lord, in answer to that prayer and the faith of his people, wiped out the entire army of the king of Assyria in one moment, delivering that southern kingdom and buying them a little more time. Now, we know that they didn't last a lot longer because their idolatry and rebellion brought God's judgment upon them. But Isaiah served in this time of turbulence, of danger, and of fear. And in the midst of that, God gave him this vision followed by all of these other directives of God's revelation in this whole beautiful book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, King Uzziah was generally, you can read about this in 2 Chronicles 26, was generally a good king. He's described as, as being a good king who followed the Lord, but toward the end of his life, his pride led to his undoing. He decided that he wanted to experience something that only the priests were to experience. And he went into the temple and burned incense to have some kind of a spiritual encounter with God. And the high priest and 80 other priests went and confronted him, saying, this is not your place. This is not your role. The king is not to go into the temple. Only the priests are to do ministry in the temple, and the king grew angry, rejected their advice until he looked down at his body and saw that he'd been stricken with leprosy. So King Uzziah ended his life in quarantine, set apart from the whole nation of Israel, unable to rule anymore, unable to even be with people anymore because he did what was forbidden for all but the priests. And he should have known better because this had this lesson had been learned before. You remember the two sons of the two sons of, uh, of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, who had the same idea hundreds of years before this to say, "We want to experience the presence of God. We want to step into the holy place of the temple. We want to burn incense in there like our dad, the high priest." But it's only for the high priest to enter the holy place, and so the fire of the Lord came out and consumed those two sons of Aaron, and they died right there before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is, this is what the Lord has said, Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. Before all the people, I will be glorified. The temple was the holy place. It was the most sacred location. By teaching his people about the temple about the tabernacle first and then the temple, about the Ark of the Covenant, about these holy places and holy people and holy items. God was making known his own holiness. It wasn't about the temple or the Ark. It was about the holiness of God. He says, I will be sanctified, which means I will be acknowledged as 
holy. When we pray, pray the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. It's not that we're making his name holy. It's we're acknowledging that his name is holy. I will be sanctified among all people. I will be glorified. The temple was sacred. It was set apart for the purposes of God as he had defined them. The holy items were set apart. There was nothing particularly special about the Ark of the Covenant. It was a box covered with gold with some angels on it. But what made it special is that God declared it to be special. This box is unlike any other Ark, any other container in the entire nation of Israel. It is to be handled in a very specific way, never to be touched by human hands. But under King David, as it was being moved, instead of carrying it on poles as instructed, they moved it on a cart, and Uzzah was walking beside it, and he put out his hand to take hold of it, for the oxen stumbled, but the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. Again, another lesson about the holy things of God. Uzzah made the very false assumption that his hand was cleaner than the ground. And he died for that mistake. The ground has committed no rebellion against God. Our hands have committed great rebellion against God, even the hands of the priests and the prophet. To be, to be holy is to be set apart. To be designated as a special item. So in a, in a small way, anything can be holy. If you have a pair of socks that you only wear for the bucks on game day, those are holy socks. You've set them apart for a purpose. If you have well, a mug in your cupboard that you only bring out to have coffee with your dad, that is a holy mug. It's reserved for one purpose. If you have a photo album you only pull out once a year on your anniversary, that is a holy relic that you reserve for a special occasion. Anything in that sense can be holy. Anything you set apart and that is special and unique in your house, in your family, in your tradition. Obviously, these items, the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, were holy in a much more serious way. This room is holy, right? We call this our worship center because this is where we gather to sing the praises of God. In a sense, it's nothing, there's no difference with the drywall and the carpet and the chairs. It's just like any other place you would go, but we have made this place holy. Because it's where we gather to sing the praises of our God. So what we'll see in this passage is three ways we can respond to the holiness of God. That we first need to see his glory as Isaiah did. Experience God's grace and then commit to his mission as we hear him calling our name. Three ways to respond to the holiness of God. First of all, we need to see God and his glory. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. There are several symbols in this passage, and that's where we get these ideas of the glory of God. And the, the first set of symbols that we see illustrate God's power, his authority, his reign, obviously the throne. Only a king sits on a throne, and this is a throne unlike any other throne. This is a throne so large that it's high and, and lifted up. And this robe that demonstrates royalty is so enormous it fills the entire temple area. The lesson from King Uzziah is that to approach God in his glory, we do not set the terms for that encounter. We follow the terms that God has Put in place. That was the lesson that Uzziah learned in trying to go into the temple on his own terms. God is the one who defines the way that a sinful people can approach him as a holy God. In verse 5, Isaiah cries out, Woe is me, I am lost, I am undone, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies. My eyes have seen the king. Now, we know from the book of the law, from, from Moses' 
words in the first five books, we know that you cannot see. No human can see the face of God and live. So Isaiah sees a vision. He sees a, you know, a, a picture, an image of the glory of God. And he realizes in that moment that he should die. He says, I've now I've seen the king. I've seen the Lord of hosts. And I'm lost. I'm doomed. I cannot live. It's for us, it would be like staring directly into the sun. Our eyes are simply not capable of that. If you or I stepped into the holy presence of God to look on him right now, we would be vaporized by his holiness and glory. We are not yet prepared for that meeting. Not until we are glorified and the last remnants of our sins are removed from us will we be prepared to stand in God's presence. The eyes that we have right now to see God and we would die. And that's what Isaiah realized. To see God in his glory, we first need to see his supreme and glorious power. Seated on a throne, high and, and lifted up. God is absolutely sovereign. He reigns over all things. He is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. That should be supremely comforting to us as those who believe in and belong to the Lord. He is the sovereign king. We, we don't always see this truth so clearly. Sometimes our lives feel out of control and we wonder about the sovereignty of God. Is he still in control? Is he still on his throne? This, this is a pulling back of the curtain to see a scene that we as humans don't get to see. God on his throne in heaven, surrounded by the angels who are worshiping him. He is always on his throne. He is always reigning in power. Nothing ever changes that. We simply journey by faith through times when we need to believe in that truth. Have you seen God? High and lifted up, seated on his throne. Have you experienced this reality? God in his supreme power. One of my favorite Bible studies to lead is called Christianity Explored. It's an eight-week journey through the Gospel of Mark. We've done that once here at Oakwood, and I hope we'll do it again in the near future. Um, but it's a very quick journey through the Gospel of Mark. And the homework from the first session is to study Mark 1 and 2 and look at five different stories where Jesus demonstrates his authority. He goes into the synagogue and he teaches, and everyone's like, this, this guy's not like our rabbis. He teaches with authority, not coming from... The other rabbis and the traditions and the commentaries, he teaches as if he has authority of his own, right? He heals people with just a word, and they're like, what is this authority? Where does this power come from to just speak and people get healed? Demons respond to him. He casts them out with a word, and the people wonder at his authority. He has this encounter with a paralyzed man lowered down in front of him, and first, he forgives the man's sin, and the leaders, the religious leaders say, who does this guy think he is? claiming the authority to forgive sins. And Jesus says, listen, which do you think is harder? To say your sins are forgiven or to tell, tell the guy to get up and walk? And of course, Jesus knows the much harder thing is to pronounce sins forgiven because a payment will have to be made for that statement. But he's like, I'll do the easier thing if that'll help you. And he tells the guy to get up and walk. As we were going through that study one time, with a, uh, there, there was this one woman who's reading these sections. What is Jesus' authority? Man, his authority over illness, his authority over demons, his authority over nature as he calms the storm, his authority to teach, his authority to call disciples, his authority to forgive sins. And she says, she sits back and looks at this and she's like, man, this seems like Jesus has authority over everything. <laughs> like, exactly, there it is. Do you think that means that Jesus has authority over your addictions? Do you think that means that Jesus has authority and power to help in your marriage, to help you with your kids? Boy, it looks like Jesus has authority over everything. That is the whole message of the Bible. That we might see the Lord exalted on his throne. The word Messiah means king. If we had a Jewish background, we would know that. The Messiah was the anointed one. You're reading through the Bible, you see how David is anointed. That marks him as the king. Messiah means king. We hear Messiah, we think savior, don't we? We think, oh, isn't that wonderful that our Messiah has come to save us from our... And that's a part of it. But primarily, Messiah 
means king, the one who reigns. That's why they thought he was going to establish the kingdom of Israel right then. He said, no, it's a spiritual kingdom for now. But step one in responding to God's holiness is to see his glory and his supreme power. That's the first set of symbols, the throne and the robe. But then we see that it's not just his power, it's also his purity. The temple represents holiness and purity. The fullness of God's untouchable holiness. That's what the temple was about. That's what the angels, as they, these seraphim who were flying around on six wings, even angels who are untainted by sin, in the presence of God, they have to cover their feet and cover their faces before the holiness and, and glory of God. Have you seen the Lord this way in his absolute purity? The song that they sing Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, declaring his total separation from this world, how our God is utterly unlike anything on this earth, anything that we know or have experienced. He is exalted in his purity. Very similar to John's vision in Revelation chapter 4, as again the curtain is open and, and John is get, he gets to see into the throne room of God in the same song. That was being sung 700 years before in the time of Isaiah, still being sung as John sees a vision of the throne room of God and these angels, these divine beings hovering around the throne who never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We'll close in a few minutes by singing that great hymn of the faith, holy, holy, holy. Though the darkness hide me, Though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy. There is none beside thee perfect in power, in love, and purity. Do we see the truth about the holiness of our God? And we go on with these symbols to see one, one more statement that the whole earth is full of his glory. So God is supreme, not only in power, not only in purity, but in every perfection. The whole earth is full of reflections of his glory, of every perfection. When we, when we say God is good, what we mean is that he is good in every possible way. He defines what goodness is. <laughs> He embodies every perfection in his very nature. A pastor friend of mine articulated the 13 virtues of Jesus. So how can we know the perfections and glories of God? Well, we look at Jesus to see them. And in his life and ministry, we see 13 glorious perfections. You can see the first batch kind of comes from the fruit of the Spirit. And then he adds a few others. But Jesus is perfect in love, joy, peace, patience, generosity, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Wisdom, hope, discipline, humility, zeal. Do you see how Jesus embodies every perfection? That's his expression of the very nature of God. This is what Isaiah saw from his throne. The light of God's glorious supremacy. Supreme in power and purity and in every perfection. And in, in the light of God's glory, we then, like Isaiah, begin to see the truth about ourselves. You ever been to someone's house that is just pristine, you know? One of those kind of incorrigible housekeepers, you know, like that's just so clean that there's not a speck out of place. You sit down to dinner and there's not even a, a water spot on the glasses, you know, like that kind of thing. So imagine you've been working outside in the, in the garden all day, you know, and you're dirty, your, your knees are dirty, your hands are dirty. Imagine that you came into this pristine house, you know. Imagine how you would feel with looking at the dirt on your feet and the dirt on your hands and you're like, and, and you can just see the, the tile that is just sparkling and you'd be like, how can I, how can I step on it? Now, if you, if you walked into a barn filled with animals, and covered in dirt, you would feel totally comfortable, right? You'd be like, no worries, this is what I want to be wearing. But you step into Buckingham Palace, right? You step into a wedding reception, 
or you come to this friend's house who has immaculate floors, right? You're going to immediately feel uncomfortable because in that place of purity, your uncleanness is exposed. It's contrasted. That's what happens to Isaiah. The foundations of the thresholds shook to hear these angels shouting back and forth. The house was filled with smoke and he said, woe is me. I'm lost. I'm doomed. I cannot live through this encounter. But seeing the glory of God puts us in a position to experience his grace as we acknowledge and recognize the truth of our condition. He says, I'm lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why did Isaiah feel specifically exposed about his lips? He was a, he was a prophet. His ministry was talking. He was a holy prophet, arguably, other than Moses, the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. And yet, he feels exposed for the uncleanness of his lips. Now, I relate to this as one who talks for a living. And I feel the exposure of that. Those who teach will be judged more strictly, James reminds us. Isaiah felt that reality. He felt that conviction. He said, in the glorious presence of God, I realize how fallible and sinful and selfish and prideful even my words have been. And then, of course, he sees that about the whole nation. If the prophet's lips are unclean, how unclean are those of the people? And of course, it's not about their lips. It's what we say demonstrates the reality of our hearts. It's from the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks, Jesus says. So our unclean speech, our selfishness and sin that comes out of our mouth is just an expression of the deeper problem in our hearts. If we struggle in the church to control our tongues, how much more is that true of our culture where people are so quick, the favorite exclamation today is to take God's name in vain. To use the name of Jesus as an, as an exclamation or a swear word. This is, that is no small sin. It's called blasphemy. It's a violation of the third commandment. To use God's name other than in worship. Other than saying, hallowed be thy name. We live among a people of unclean lips. And the, the light of God's glory shines through our, our surface righteousness to show us the truth. It's like an x-ray that shows us what's inside of us. If we want to experience God's grace, we first need to recognize the truth of our condition, that all of us share this indictment of Isaiah where we say, woe is me. I am a man or woman of unclean lips. I am a sinner deserving only the judgment of of God. But once we make that confession, we are positioned to receive cleansing from the Lord. One of these angels flies to the altar, takes a burning coal from the altar that is before the throne of God, and touches Isaiah's mouth, saying, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Hear this, brothers and sisters, if, if you belong to Jesus by faith, then he says these words to you. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Imagine if you were Isaiah in that moment. This burning coal that touches your lips. When he woke up from that vision, you can almost imagine him running to a mirror to see if his face was now disfigured, right? To see if the pain would still linger from that cold touching his, his lips. As far as we know, there was no damage done to Isaiah through this. Think about what that means. The coal did not burn him. It did not harm him. It cleansed him. Why? It came from the altar before the throne of God. 
The altar as that place of sacrifice where atonement was made. Why was the coal hot? Because sacrifices had to be burned up on that altar. How could that coal have a cleansing power? Only because the day was coming when a sacrifice would be laid upon that altar. The book of Hebrews tells us that those items in the temple, the temple itself and everything in it, were just shadows and symbols of the real temple and the real altar in the throne room of God in heaven. Isaiah in his vision sees into that real throne room, to the real altar. Think about this. When Jesus was crucified, it looked to the world like he was hanging on a Roman cross outside of Jerusalem, but he wasn't. He was laying himself down on the altar in the throne room of God in heaven. That's where he really was. What people saw was a shadow and a symbol of the real thing that was happening in heaven. Think about that. Jesus, the Lamb of God, laid down on the altar of God's justice... The knife of God's judgment fell upon him, and the fire of God's wrath consumed him. The cross is a picture, it's a window, it's a shadow. The real thing that was happening was Jesus was being consumed by the divine fury of God in the altar in heaven. Listen to how the writer of the Hebrews says it. Christ entered... Not in the holy places made with hands. Those are just copies of the true things. But Jesus entered heaven itself to appear before the presence of God on our behalf. He appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. He doesn't have to die many times like the old sacrifices were offered over and over again. Thousands upon thousands of sacrifices. No, Jesus offered himself as the once for all sacrifice, the perfect one-time offering. He was burned up by those fiery coals in the altar in heaven so that his sacrifice could purify us. That's why the coal did not burn Isaiah's mouth. Jesus prepared that altar so that we need not be consumed by the wrath of God. We can instead be cleansed by his holy touch. Jesus put away our sin by the sacrifice of himself. Do you hear these words from Isaiah 6? Behold, this has touched your lips your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Jesus says those words to every single person who comes to him in faith. Your guilt is taken away. He was able to remove our sins, to put it away from us, because he was the perfect sacrifice for sin. The Holy One of Heaven, the only one who ever lived who was without sin, allowed himself to be covered in our sin. The Almighty Creator of all things surrendered his power and his rights and laid down his life for us. The Almighty King and the Lord of Heaven's armies surrendered himself into death, laid himself down on that altar. He was consumed by the fire of God's wrath that we might be cleansed through his sacrifice. We can receive cleansing in Christ, but the good news doesn't stop there. We receive righteousness in Christ. Romans 8 says, those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. This is why God saved us that we might become like Jesus, conformed to his image. Those he predestined, he also called. This Isaiah 6 is the call of Isaiah. 
He called your name. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. To be justified is to be declared righteous. Our word justified plays on the, on the old English word just, which means righteousness, justice, and, and holiness. A better way to say it is that those he called, he also righteousified. In the same way that Jesus spoke this universe into being simply by saying, let there be light. When you put your faith in Jesus, he spoke this truth into you. He said, you are justified. I have removed your sins from you. I've taken them upon myself. And in this moment of your faith, I am putting my righteousness not just on you, but in you. He spoke that as a judicial declaration. The Catholic Church calls this doctrine that we celebrate called imputed righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus imputed to us as believers, given credit to us. The Catholic Church calls that a legal fiction. They say this is nonsense. God cannot declare something that isn't true. And they point to the practical reality and say, look, you're not righteous. You're not righteous. I'm not righteous. Why would God declare us righteous if it's not true? It's a legal fiction. Imputed righteousness. No. This is not a legal fiction. This is the spiritual transformation of the gospel. This is the legal declaration of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who speaks this truth into the believer, saying, now you are righteous. Praise the Lord, it's not a legal fiction. Amen. It is a glorious declaration of the only one who has the right to say it. He spoke this truth into you. He said, your guilt is Removed. Your sin is atoned for. The altar that consumed Jesus will not consume us. Instead, the sacrifice on that altar cleanses us. And in Christ, we are born again. We are made new. We become a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The old self is crucified with Christ. A new creation is born in him. Not a legal fiction, but a glorious revelation of the gospel of the righteousness of God. When we see God in his glory, we're in position to experience his grace. Not only to be cleansed from our sins, but to be declared righteous in Christ. And then the third response to God's Glorious holiness is to commit to his mission. Here Isaiah hears the voice of God saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah stepped forward. Here I am. Send me. To accept Jesus as Savior is to accept him as Lord. You cannot have him as Savior without committing to him as Lord. I don't even like the phrase accept Jesus. We don't accept Jesus as if he's okay and we're saying he's fine. He accepts us, we beg him to accept us. And here's the glorious truth of the gospel. He does. He not only accepts us into his family, he accepts us into himself. To be a Christian is to be alive in Christ. He draws us into his very being. This is why he can declare us righteous. Not because we're righteous in ourselves, but because he is righteous. And he's called us into himself. He's made us one with him, united with him. Three ways to respond to God's call. First, you need to hear it. Have you heard the voice of God saying this to you? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? God calls every one of us onto mission with him. It's not a question of if you've been called as a missionary. It's a question of where You've been called as a missionary. Hear God's call. Then present yourself to him. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you in view of God's mercy to present your bodies 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Just as Jesus laid down his body on the altar before the Lord, he calls us to do the same, to lay down our bodies on the altar. What kind of rights does a sacrifice have as it is strapped to the altar? What kind of power does that sacrifice has, have as, it, as its neck is laid back and the knife comes across it? That's the picture of our Christian devotion to the Lord as we are to present ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice, laying down our rights, laying down our plans and saying, my life is yours. Cut away everything that offends you that I might deny myself, take up my cross and follow after you. Whatever you want from me, here am I, send me. And then we are called to proclaim his glory and grace. What you've experienced from God is your ministry. It's not your job to proclaim the grace of God to someone else. It's your job to proclaim his grace to you. What you have seen, what you have experienced, that is your message. The rest of Isaiah chapter 6 is, a, is actually a very sad commission, isn't it? Go to this nation that is not going to listen. The book of Acts ends with Paul preaching to the Jews and then quoting this passage and then another one later in Isaiah where he's like, you Jews, you didn't listen. But that's exactly what Isaiah said was going to happen. That was Isaiah's ministry. Go to a stubborn and rebellious people that will not listen. Doesn't that feel a lot like our assignment here in America? It doesn't mean we stop preaching. It doesn't mean we stop sharing. We continue to press on just like Isaiah did, even we, though we know most people will not respond. Their response is not our responsibility. Our job is to proclaim what we have seen, what we know to be true, the glory of our God and the grace we've experienced. One of the things we want to encourage this summer is that each one of us would prepare a two or three minute video testimony. If you can't prepare a selfie video, get one of your kids or grandkids to help you and it's very easy. Trust me on this. The bigger challenge is just writing it out. Two or three minutes, no more than that, to express your life before Christ. What a mess you were and trust me, you were a mess. I was too. How did you come to see the glory of God, to understand the gospel and how is your life different right now? We're gonna give you some examples through the summer, we want to collect these videos. We want to get 50, 60, 80 of these two or three minute testimony videos saying, that's my story. And we're going to attempt, we're not a big social media church, but we're going to try. Okay, we're going to try something with social media coming into the fall to try and, you know, blitz the YouTube page and Facebook and just all these stories coming out to say, here's what I've experienced. Let me share that with you. So young people, we're going to need help. Okay, we're going to need help with this. Help the old people. There you go. Look at this, though. I want to close with this picture of, of Peter. Isaiah saw a vision of the Lord exalted in the temple. Isaiah was a prophet. He lived his whole life around the temple. Look at how Jesus revealed himself to Peter. He gets in the boat with Peter, and he's like, hey, dude, throw the net over the other side. And Peter's like, listen, we've been out all night. I've been doing this for years, Jesus. There's no way there's going to be fish over there. He's like, all right, since you say so. He drops the net. They came, and they filled both boats so full that the two boats began to sink. Do you see the contrast here? Isaiah sees a vision of God exalted on a throne in the temple with angels flying around him. The, the experience for Peter was on the Sea of Galilee with two boats so full of fish they were going to sink. And then look at Peter's response, exactly like Isaiah's. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Basically quoting Isaiah 6. How has God made himself known to you? To a prophet 700 years before Jesus, he revealed himself in the temple. To a fisherman in the first century, he said, let me show you my power over fish. <laughs> Jesus tells every fish in the Sea of Galilee, I want you right here at this time. Here's the time you'll see if the net will come. Jump in. And the fish are like, yes, sir. They jump in. Peter sees that impossible miracle and he falls down before the Lord. How did God Show his glory to you. How did you experience his grace? What was your moment when the gospel became clear, when you bowed down before Jesus and said, woe is me, I'm a sinful man? What was that moment when God called you and said, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? What does that look like for you? Let's share our stories and encourage each other with that. May we see God's glory, experience his grace, and commit 
to his mission together. We're going to close by singing that great hymn of the faith. Holy, holy, holy. I'll invite the worship team to come up as I pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you as the God of all glory, supreme in power, supreme in purity and in every perfection. We bow before you as the King of all kings and the, and the Lord of all lords. We profess, Lord Jesus, that yours is the name above every name. Every knee will bow before you one day, but we bow before you right now as our King, our Savior, and our Lord. We join in that heavenly chorus to say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this summer to rest in you. Help us to experience you as we continue through the Bible, as we open the Bible every day, every week, as we gather in groups. Help us to see your glory. Help us to increasingly see our own sin and come to you for cleansing and power and strength to walk in your holiness. And Lord, commission us for ministry. Give us boldness and courage to go wherever you send us to do whatever you would have us to do. We are your servants. We're here to do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, I invite you to please join us and stand and sing with us to the Holy Lord. <laughs>
right here in this room for our worship and prayer night. And let's close with these words that we just sang from Revelation chapter 4. The four living creatures with six wings and eyes all around, day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him seated on the throne, the 24 elders fall down before him who's seated on the throne. They worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. Thank you.